Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of GUCast. This is Declan Murphy, urologist here at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, rejoined, I'm pleased to say, by my co-host, Dr. Renu Epen, urologist here at Peter Mac. Welcome back, Renu. It's so good to be back. Uh, I mean, my first in-person conference in two and a half years, it was fantastic, but... Very relieved to be home again. <laughs> Travel's just not the same. Just not the same. Just not the same. It seems like such a novelty heading off yeah. overseas. And, um. It was worth it though. I mean, it was fantastic to get back to San Francisco. Ascogee was really great. Great to catch up with old colleagues and friends and... It was really good. And maybe learn a little bit, tiny bit. Oh, yeah, that too. And that, you did. That was definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we enjoyed your talk. Um, uh, oh, your, yeah, uh, yeah. your talk was fantastic. The best of Surgical Journal highlights from last year. So that's really good. It if you was, haven't uh, seen Renu's talk, we'll mm. post it on uh, the link today. She did a fantastic talk looking at the best uh, urology papers in surgery, surgical papers published last year, 2021. Um, but welcome back. It's great to have you. And we had a couple great of good stand in hosts. Yes, did, you, did you listen? I, I listened in. It was good. I, I thought you guys wouldn't miss me. We did miss you. We kept <laughs> shouting out to you, but we had... Uh, no, it was fantastic. We really had Daniel really Moon stepping in and we had yeah. uh, Viru Kazi, our new fellow here at Theatre right. Mac, who's joining us again this morning, actually. Yeah. But I thought they did a great job. But, yeah. you know, everyone was very nervous stepping into your, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> your big little oh, shoes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, also welcome back to uh, Aoife McVeigh, who is our registrar here, who joined us a couple of uh, episodes ago as well. And Aoife is going to step in every so often to do her little segment on... Did we come up with a name for it? I can't recall uh, what's happening on Twitter I, or Aoife's. Yeah, I was thinking about this and I was going to think of a new name and then I actually have quite warmed to the old name. Well, <laughs> what the was first the old name, name, which is just things I've seen on Twitter this week. Oh, it's we okay. have to come up with something shorter yeah. and catchier, think? I think. Uh, yeah. Um, well, Sean suggested one to me, but I can't remember what it is. Okay. That, okay. If you uh, can't I remember will. it, then okay. it wasn't that memorable. But uh, anyway, yeah. it's out there. If anyone is interested in uh, naming Aoife's segment where she basically yeah. trolls around the internet to see what's interesting, uh, and she's going to pop onto the podcast every so often and tell us about it. But we, uh, it's the segment with no name, I think, uh, yeah. for the moment. That's what yeah. we're calling it. But anyway, did you find anything that caught your eye this week? Um, well, you sort of beat me to the punch. I feel like from Asco GU, and I haven't got paid off to say this. I thought Renu's, um, your presentation was amazing. <laughs> I learned so much from it. Um, and even just the the editing, the, how, how it was presented, it was so engaging. Um, I thought it was amazing. I sent it to all my registrar friends and was like, this is... <laughs> I had a little bit great. of help with that, didn't I, Declan? <laughs> you did a great job. That You're the talent. Doing I, I'm that. just it was, the, uh, the fixer in the background. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was fun. The, the, the new way of, of presenting material, I yeah. think. Well, it is, isn't yeah. it? Because um, I suppose the, the point about some of those hybrid type meetings now is they will sometimes ask you to pre-prepare your talk, even if you're there and, and send a video. So mm. um, we have an interest in not just doing a Zoom style video or a PowerPoint video. We like making videos using video software. So yeah. that's what Renew did this time. And it is entertaining, I yeah. think, and engaging. So. They kept asking yeah. me for the PowerPoint slides and I, I kept saying, what, what PowerPoint slides? <laughs> PowerPoint's very 1990s. <laughs> but Aoife, awesome. You can you should be here every week, I think. <laughs> here we go. I'll take my bribe later. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing that I had seen this week, and I've actually seen it pop up a few times now on Twitter, um, is that hashtag Euro tips and tricks. Um, yes. So they're actually just little um, surgical tricks um, that I suppose anyone can sort of, if they have one that they want to share with uh, Twitter and the urology world can just hashtag it. And I think the original one that really got traction was from um, Dr. Alex uh, Kutukov um, from Fox Chase in Philadelphia. Yeah. And that was how to get rid of those annoying bubbles that, you know, affect your view resecting during a TURBT. And all you I have remember to do, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and all you have to do is uh, switch off the irrigation and the outflow and just, you know, sort of gently uh, pop the end of the scope up into it and it just disappears. So just, you know, really yeah. easy but high yield sort of stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I do follow along um, with those as well. Fantastic. Yeah. So what's that hashtag? Alex started it, didn't he? Hashtag yeah. Euro tips or something. Euro tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. good we'll post you, it uh, yeah. in the links. Yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing he would do. He's a friend yeah. of the podcast, a good friend of ours. But yeah. little short videos, tips and tricks, little yeah. annoyances in urology. We love that. Yeah. And um, and you had already highlighted one a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, um, there's, a, there's been a few. So keep yeah, them up. They're all yeah. great. Um, and yeah, and I think obviously more broader than that and sort of what links into it is obviously it's um, very sad what's happening in, in Ukraine at the moment. Um, and I'd seen that, I think Alex is of Ukrainian descent and his fellow um, 
uh, Dr. Laura Bakavina. I think she's one of the fellows at Fox Chase as well. Um, it looks like she's traveling to the Polish and Ukrainian border um, to help refugees there. And it looks like there's a page where you can um, accept donations. So that's, um, you know, if anyone wants to help and uh, that's sort of links in with everything. Um, I think that's uh, obviously a really lovely gesture of her. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, we'll put links and shout out to Laura yeah. and Alex. And um, yeah, uh, stand with Ukraine, urologist yeah. for Ukraine. There's a few hashtags going around. Yeah. And um, um, I was chatting to Laura last night and we're going to have her, have her on the podcast from the mm-hmm. Polish-Ukrainian border mm-hmm. next week to talk about it. And uh, yeah, look, it's way beyond urology, isn't it? But there are yeah. many urologists of Ukrainian descent, including our colleague in here, Renu. Nathan Lorenzo. Nathan yes. Lorenzo. Yeah. Um, Nathan, yes. whose dad uh, left uh, the Ukraine when he was 10 years old and, and moved yeah. to Australia. Um, and we joined them for the, the Melbourne uh, uh, protest this weekend, joined his family and um, to support them. So, yeah, very sad, very worrying as we speak here at this time. Uh, where are we, 3rd or 4th of March? It's uh, still very worrying, of course. Um, that's yeah. great. Aoife, anything else yeah. from you? Um, and then I think my last sort of celebrity uh, inject is that Kanye West is still losing his mind, sadly. So he's just oh. going off on all these <laughs> crazy rants and he's getting, you know, lookalike new girlfriends, you know, look exactly like Kim Kardashian. But oh. I think there'll be more progression there. So we can maybe chat about it the next time as well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. You, you <laughs> mentioned some other celebrity the last time well, i had no idea what Kardashian you were talking about can, related, yeah, can, yeah, you, can you just send me the name before so yeah, i can look I them up and pretend i know i will i have a very sh- sheltered life i don't yeah. i don't know these yeah people. we we have to do <laughs> our research bored. on your research yeah, Aoife, exactly. it's, You're uh, it's, a, us. it's a terrible situation <laughs> i don't think i don't know if i should be proud of um, knowing all this nonsense but anyway, <laughs> anyway. well look yeah. thanks very much and uh, uh, great to have you keep it yeah. all up and um if you've got suggestions for Aoife, or you, you know you want to catch your eye and um, we'll put a link in or you'll see it on youtube uh, to her Twitter handle, just reach out to her and she can give you a shout and so on. Um, Thank you very much. Um, And that's it. So thank you. And uh, on to the the main event. So we're coming back to one of our favourite topics today, aren't we? Yeah, I'm surrounded by MRI experts. It's a little bit intimidating right now. MRI prostate. (laughs) MRI prostate. I thought this was sort of done and dusted, I must say. So it's all good as far as I... Oh, right. I mean, we've, we've, we've reached a consensus on this, haven't we? Yeah. So instead of just PSA is up, Maybe do some risk stratification yeah. uh, and go and do a, a trust biopsy. Instead, everyone should pretty much have an MRI, MRI. of the prostate. Yeah. Uh, that's what these pivotal trials, precision uh, especially, promise, others have said. And then it's either the guidelines. avoid a biopsy if the yeah. MRI is okay or if there's a lesion on the MRI in particular, great, we can target the lesion, probably only target the lesion. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, that's been a huge change in, in practice over the past only five or six years, uh, certainly. Probably the maybe one of the biggest single changes I've seen in my entire career yeah. is the adoption of MRI into the top of the early detection pathway, and it's in all the guidelines. I think, all the it? guidelines, and you know, and one of the uh, one of the papers I highlighted at ASCO GU was from the SDH LM3 consortium that showed its value in even the screening population. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's really stamped in our practice. Yeah. So what are, why are we talking about it again? Or just to reinforce why it's a good thing. You know? I think so, right? Yeah. I, that's, that's what we're doing. Now, we did have a podcast episode a, a few months ago when we invited on um, friends of the podcast, uh, Matt, Matt Cooperberg um, and Ben Davies, uh, to talk about this topic. And suddenly we, we, you know, there were questions being asked and Matt was pushing back quite hard and a couple of interesting pieces had been published saying, well, hold on, it's not as straightforward as that. Um, and we've had a couple of really interesting articles um, uh, uh, written about this topic that perhaps you know this targeting of lesion strategy may actually lead to um, potentially even some harm uh, over diagnosis, over treatment. The old things I thought that MRI had actually got rid of are now being brought back into a conversation to say, well, hang on, let's look a little closer at this strategy of targeting lesions yeah. in, in particular. So with that in mind, um, we've got two fantastic, three fantastic guests yeah. uh, coming on, two on Zoom and one here in the studio. It's a great uh, pleasure to welcome back again, Dr. Viru Kazi, uh, stand-in GU cast uh, co-host now as well. Viru, welcome back. Sorry to take your spot, Viru. Yeah. Uh, Oh, well, thank you for having me, Renee, before. <laughs> I feel like a regular now. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Veer's been on before. He's our fellow here at the moment, actually, but uh, he was first author on the precision study. Uh, this has been his main research interest, uh, the role of MRI in early detection. Um, and joining us uh, on Zoom uh, is his boss and mentor, uh, uh, Caroline Moore, Professor Caroline Moore from UCL in London. Uh, Caroline, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to see you again. Thanks. Thanks. It's great to join you. 
Fantastic. So Caroline. Caroline's joined us for a couple now, yeah. isn't she? Yeah, she's a regular. She was on the very first podcast. Yes, that's right. Uh, there you go. Claim to fame. And there we're still we go. going. We're yes. still rabbiting on here. Uh, yeah, more than two years ago, Caroline joined us on the very first podcast. So Caroline's a urologist. We train together in London, actually work on temporaries yeah. uh, and has a huge research interest in early detection, MRI, focal therapy, that whole area. Yeah. Uh, so welcome back, Caroline. And also joining us, I think for the first time on the podcast, but old friend of mine, uh, Andrew Vickers, Dr. Andrew Vickers. Um, uh, Andrew from, uh, is a research methodologist and biostatistician from the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you on GUcast. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a pleasure. I, I mean, I think, I think you mentioned me in your last one as an eminent statistician. So <laughs> I, I, you know, when you're talking to Kareem, so I, uh, I'm a, little, I'm a little worried now that I, I won't actually match up to your uh, prior description. Oh, it's good to mm. butter people up before you. Yeah. Anyway, no, it's fantastic to have you. Um, I've known you for very many years, and um, uh, I've uh, we've enjoyed uh, much academic exchange. So I've been to your house. We've had good fun together here and there, uh, and it's lovely to have you back. Um, but we've invited you back in particular because you certainly have been. Uh, one of the um, uh, people out there who has written some really nice pieces, challenging perhaps some of those things we just said in our introduction about what we might have presumed is the very clear benefits of MRI. And I think you'll also acknowledge that one of the benefits is clearly avoiding biopsy or avoiding overdiagnosis of low risk disease. But the other thing that I, you know, I've certainly thought was a kind of a given is that targeting lesions and finding these more significant cancers was sort of a, 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 an assumed um, benefit uh, of MRI targeted biopsies. But You've written a few pieces about this recently. We'll put links uh, in the show notes and so on. Would you like to just summarize for us um, your thoughts or your concerns about uh, MRI-targeted biopsies, potentially leading to overdiagnosis and overtreatment? Yeah, well, look, you, you've set it up very nicely by, I'm not talking about MRI, right? MRI is a whole pathway. There's MRI imaging, and you can use that for all sorts of things. You mentioned focal therapy, for example. Uh, you can use it to select some men at low risk who don't need biopsy. So great, we're avoiding unnecessary biopsy, we're probably avoiding overdiagnosis and, and overtreatment. Um, so we need to separate that out from MRI targeting. And the papers I've been writing have been very specifically about the, the use of targeting. Um, and I, I, I guess I put a question back to you. I mean, all of this is under the remit of early detection of prostate cancer. Why do we do this? Why are we even here talking about early detection of prostate cancer? What, what are we trying to do, Declan? And what are we trying to avoid when oh, we do it? That's a question yeah. for you, Declan. He's, yeah. he's, he's asking me. I that. think yeah. uh, he's just buttering me up. It's part of the strategy. I called him eminent <laughs> last week, and now he's asking me the question. I, I suspect yeah. it's because he wants to humiliate me. But I'm going to very clearly say to you, the guests on the program today know way more about this than me. So I'm going to go straight to Caroline Moore and uh, ask her to comment on on, uh, on this. Right. I mean, in the most general sense, why do we do PSA? Why do we biopsy guys? You know, what is the purpose of early detection of prostate cancer? Oh, OK. I'm it's happy like, to talk about that. But, you know, early yeah, detection. That's, a really easy, that's an easy one. Well, right? like, like, like with all solid cancers, uh, it's to try and adopt the principle that if we detect solid cancers early and if they are clinically significant, if that detection early and appropriate treatment early is going to lead to to an improvement in uh, survival or quality of life for these men, then generally early detection is something that in very, very many disease states, not just prostate cancer, we explore. However, there are, of course, caveats with that. The whole thing of detecting asymptomatic conditions must be challenged right. to make sure we're not detecting and over-treating these. So that's that's the background, isn't it? But yeah, right, right. And it's been so, well explored so in I, prostate cancer prior to MRI, right, of course. Exactly. Right. The purpose of early detection is to reduce mortality, and we don't want to detect or treat too many cancers. And so when we're looking at MR, now let's go back to 2008, which was about when we first started hanging out and academically collaborating. And MRI was just starting to, you know, poke above the parapet then. What was the problem? What were we discussing? Were we saying, oh my goodness, we keep on having these guys, we, we give them a systematic biopsy, and then three years later, they're showing up in my clinic with a Gleason 9 and dying a few years later. I mean, that's not what people were talking about. They weren't saying, we need to detect more cancers. We need to treat more cancers. That was never the problem. The, there, were, there, were, there was one major problem and there was one minor problem. The major problem was overdiagnosis and overtreatment. The minor problem is that we did have these men come in 
and they would have a PSA of seven and have a negative biopsy. And then they'd have a PSA of 15 and a negative biopsy. And then they'd have a PSA of 22 and they would have a negative biopsy. And MRI came along and we're like, great, now we can do an anteriorly directed MRI targeted biopsy and probably find the, the cancer that is causing this PSA elevation. And that was a, a, a very early and obvious clinical use. I Something I had personal experience of because a statistician said, Andrew, you do statistics in prostate cancer, don't you? And I said, yes. He says, my PSA is 48 and my free is two. And I've had two negative biopsies. Am I good? And I said, go get an MRI directed biopsy uh he did they found a cancer he he was cured i mean it was it, and it was quite I, I remember it at the time it was quite transformational is that we could find these tumors that we couldn't find in this you know particular clinical situation but what's happened is we've now extended that we're not doing targeted biopsy just for the cancers that we can't find we're now recommending it uh for everybody and what my papers have shown is very clear data is that that's leading, leading to overtreatments and overdiagnosis. So let's look at something like the, the TRIO study. So in the TRIO study, this was men who uh, had lesions visible on an MRI. It was done by the NCI. And uh, they did both a systematic and a targeted biopsy. Now, if your systematic biopsy was Gleason Gray group two, three, four, or five, clearly giving them a targeted, these men a targeted biopsy is very unlikely to affect their mortality, right? And it's also not likely to affect overdiagnosis or overtreatment in any important way. Um, so let's focus on the men with a negative systematic biopsy or who had grade group one, you know, for active surveillance. What that study shows is that about 20% of the men who were negative on systematic biopsy had cancer, and 13% of the total, or 60%, a little over 60% of those who had cancer had high-grade disease. So they, they had roughly 1,000 men. We're talking about finding cancer in 210 men, and we're talking about cancers that we would normally treat in 135 of those, and 134 of those men. Okay. So we're, that's a lot of additional cancers that we're finding and a lot of additional treatment that we're giving. And what we wanna know is, are we reducing mortality? Because we only wanna be treating them and we only wanna be diagnosing them if we think it's gonna reduce their mortality. And so we've gotta think, okay, what would have happened to these men had we not done the MRI targeted biopsy? I mean, yeah, these cancers look bad under the, you know, histologically, right? There were eight men with, with grade group five, you know, at least eight, nine or 10 uh, disease. We think like, oh, you know, thank God we did the MRI targeted biopsy and we found them. So let's think, you know, what data do we have on what happens to men who have a negative biopsy? There are pa this paper after paper after paper. And as you, you mentioned earlier, when we were just chatting, one has just come out uh, from Denmark, long-term follow-up of men with negative biopsy, and really nothing bad happens to them. The risk of death is incredibly low. So what I did in one of my papers is I took data from the European randomized trial in the, in the Rotterdam, and they looked at 3,000 men who had a negative biopsy in their uh, first round. So they had an elevated PSA, the first time they have ever had a, uh, a PSA test. Their biopsy, and remember, this was the 90s. This was just a sextant biopsy was negative. And they were followed up, and after 11 years, there were seven deaths out of 3,000 patients. And so you can look at the data from the NCI and say, well, for every 1,000 patients, we're going to find 200 cancers, and we're going to treat over 100, 130 men. And then you look at the data from uh, Rotterdam, and you can say, well, out of 3,000 men, there were only seven deaths. And then you can start doing some math to say, well, how many men would we need to treat? And so how many men would we need to diagnose and what proportion of those would meet traditional criteria for treatments uh, if by targeted biopsy? And so this was the paper that I published in European Urology. And the obviously you have to make some assumptions, you know, for example, how many of the um, men who died would have had cancers detectable by MRI at baseline? Uh, out of those, how many of 
the, those men, how many of their lives would have been saved by early treatment, because we know early treatment is not 100% effective. And so you put in assumptions and you can change those assumptions. I, I started with a very favorable set of assumptions for MRI, like that yeah. most of the cancers uh, would be detectable early on. Uh, that, that that led to death would be detectable by MRI, that treatment is really very effective. And we were finding out that how many men would you have to diagnose and treat? Under really favorable assumptions for MRI, you would have to treat 57 men, and you, you'd have to diagnose 90 men in order to save one life. Uh, under the more neutral assumptions, you'd have to diagnose 170 men and treat about 125 of them in order to... Uh, prevent one death. These are numbers, uh, these are levels of overdiagnosis and overtreatment uh, that, you know, we, we have, we have landmarks, we have ballparks for this, you know, we talked about 48 from the ERSPC as being too high. And now we're talking about double that under favorable assumptions. So the basic issue here is that we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. That men that do not have uh, that have negative systematic biopsies, absent another red flag, like a very high PSA or a you know, rock hard DRE or whatever it is, they are at low risk of long-term mortality. If the purpose of prostate cancer early detection is to reduce mortality, then targeting cannot reduce mortality by very much because this is an extremely low risk group. In fact, if you've had a negative biopsy, even if you have an elevated PSA, your risk of death from prostate cancer is lower than the population average. And we don't say, oh, let's go and target uh, for biopsy uh, the average you know, man in the, on the street. Okay. Wow. So I'm going to ask Caroline to comment on that, but I'll make my reaction comment to you and uh, is that, of course, even with men diagnosed with prostate cancer, we know it takes 10 or 15 years to even attempt to show there's some sort of survival benefit. So if we're taking it a step back further to you know, early detection prior to even diagnosing men, I mean, us, none, none, of us are, you know, none of us are convinced that we're going to be able to design studies that will actually meet that endpoint of survival. So, and we've all realized that for years and years. So that, that's my reaction initially yeah. is to say, I, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. We, we, we're never going to be able to achieve that or design a study that would actually prospectively determine if an MRI at the start prior to a biopsy, where you've just been talking about men who've had a negative biopsy, which doesn't happen at least in our practice anymore without an MRI. So I think the, the 15 or 20 year run in to look for survival is never going to be something that's going to make an impact in clinical practice. But that's just my initial comment. Um, Caroline, uh, no, so uh, you've been talking for f like 40 minutes oh, yeah. already. <laughs> I remember, I'm just remembering to when I was trying to convince you to go on Twitter all those years ago. Do you remember? And I said, but Andrew, you got to keep it to 140 characters or less. You said, it'll never last. And now look at you, you're, you're, you're a, a demon on Twitter. <laughs> but um, let's, let's, uh, let's hear from uh, Caroline and uh, her thoughts on this. Caroline. Has Andrew okay, got a point? Thanks. You know, it's, it's, you know, should we really challenge this assumption that targeting lesions is going to make a difference? If, uh, as he says, this is a group who are, if they've had a negative biopsy, are at very low risk of actually developing significant cancer. I mean, it's really difficult to identify or prove that any sort of intervention in prostate cancer makes it much difference anyway. So I think the first thing is to go back to, as Andrew did, first principles. Why are we doing anything about prostate cancer? And I'd say reducing mortality from prostate cancer can be done on a population level for an individual as we all know everybody's going to die when we look at the other potential benefits we can extend life if we catch disease before it becomes metastatic and we can absolutely extend and improve quality of life if we catch important cancers early only treat the important cancers and stop people getting metastatic disease. Now, if you look at the kind of context that we do things in, so are people getting a PSA every year? There have been many people in the US who might get that, in the UK, much less common to get that. Are we looking at comparing the current pathway, a PSA, a, you know, standard transrectal biopsy with what we could have 
And I would say that there's a lot of benefit, you know, it will not surprise you to, that I'm going to say there's a lot of benefit of MRI. I absolutely think we should put it in the space between a PSNA and a biopsy. The biggest sort of numerical population benefit is in not biopsying somewhere between 20% and 50% of men depending on the quality of your MRI and depending on the baseline risk of your population. If you've got a lot of people who've never had a test before, you'll find more cancer than if people have been having PSAs every year for 25 years. So then if you accept that premise, then not using the MRI to target doesn't seem to make much sense. If you see a lesion, why not find out the maximum cancer burden of that lesion in terms of millimeters of cancer and grade yeah however and i think this is a big caveat you then have to sort of impute that data <coughs> excuse me as an mri target biopsy set of data so a millimeter of three plus four might be different to to, to that which you see elsewhere because you Many of the uh, risk stratification things still look at how many cores are positive. That's not relevant in an MRI targeted biopsy. You shouldn't be looking at percentage of cores positive. You shouldn't be looking at percentage core length that's positive. You want to know the grade, the maximum tumor length, the MR visibility. Once you've got all of that, then you have to do some calculations. And in the future, I hope that we'll have more formal risk stratification that uses MRI and MRI targeted data in its risk classification so that you're not treating a standard biopsy the same as an MRI targeted biopsy. But I think, and I think that's on us as the urologists yeah. to diagnose accurately, to make big efforts to not diagnose low risk disease by avoiding standard biopsy in men with negative MRI and no other red flags, no high PSA density, et cetera. And then to look thoughtfully and carefully at what we have diagnosed and to see whether or not it's likely to need treatment. And we're not perfect in that, of course. We're not perfect in it when we use standard biopsy either. But I do think it's it's information that we should use and not ignore. And the other thing is the economics of it. So when you look at the costs of MR between different jurisdictions, it can be a, quite a cheap test. And it certainly works out in health economic terms when you avoid biopsy in men at low risk. Thanks, Caroline. I mean, great points. And, and, you know, in most of our clinical practice, you're absolutely right. MRI falls in line between an elevated PSA and a biopsy. And then to not use the information that you get from that MRI doesn't make sense. But let's let's go to Vero for his thoughts, because, you know, as, as everyone knows, the precision trial has really been a landmark trial that's changed our practice. Vero, what are your what are your thoughts here? So, um, First of all, just to say, you know, uh, Andrew, I think I applaud you for asking the question. That's our goal, right? As uh, physicians, we need to ask the question and challenge what practice is in order to try and improve the care for our patients. Um, and also, so everyone knows, we do collaborate on some work uh, in MRI. So afterwards, I'm sure we'll grab a drink. But I do disagree with you on some of the things that you said. So, um, you know, the, the editorial which you publish in European Urology, um, when I read it, my head did hurt afterwards and I think that was because uh, there was the word assumption just under 50 times um, when we look at the data set you're comparing the NCI <laughs> cancer data set and the ERSPC data set are slightly different data sets and I'm not sure how appropriate it is to compare them as you may have done um, and looking at the treatment that was given in the ERSPC we're talking some time ago and whether or not those outcomes are relevant to patients today I'm not sure. Um, I think the biggest assumption you make is that we do not adjust our treatment decisions based on the information we get from MRI targeted biopsy. And I think um, if you look at our practice in the UK, you can see from data from the National Prostate Cancer Audit, we're actually quite good at not over treating low risk prostate cancer and Gleason 3 plus 4, which is of low volume. So our over treatment rates are between 4 and 10 percent. And when we see patients in clinic who have an MRI and a visible lesion with, say, that 3 plus 4 that you might say is over-detected if you didn't have a targeted biopsy, we actually treat that differently. So, um, you know, the paper that we published from our group, uh, Stavronides et al., European Urology 2020, active surveillance cohorts, including men with 3 plus 3 and 3 plus 4, you know, just under 700 men, uh, just under 4,000 person years of follow-up. 
Um, if you look at the Kaplan Myers figure two and three, that's really quite telling. It's something I'd like to talk about. So um, the outcome in terms of metastasis and survival for patients with visible disease, visible three plus four, was worse than those for non-visible disease. So what I'm saying to you, Andrew, is I agree with you. The prognosis is different, but in the opposite direction to what you're suggesting. Mm. There you go, Andrew. There you go. Thank you for bearing with us and hearing all that. The clinicians are mm. speaking. The urologists are, are shouting back saying, come on, Andrew, this is uh, uh, you're failing to grasp that we actually are changing uh, how we interpret it. And I think that's a very, maybe we all haven't done yeah. that. It, it is different yeah. when you have, you know, incident, uh, three plus four picked up on a blind biopsy versus a targeted biopsy, two millimeters, three plus four, five percent pattern four. Uh, but we have adjusted it, I think. And, uh, and certainly we are doing a, a lot of active surveillance now in favorable intermediate risk cancer that we never did before, but probably because we have confidence to say, well, we've characterized this very well. We've done an MOR targeted biopsy. We, we do transperineal biopsies. Um, and I think we are characterizing the disease very well. But I also accept the fact that, yeah, we can't translate that into saying in 15 years time, is that improving survival? But uh, what, what, what else are we going to do? Are we going to go back to, you know, what still happens in the US, just PSA, trust biopsy, no imaging, um, you know, and prop it up with some genomic markers? Uh, I think that's a paradigm that we've left behind years ago and, and clinicians listening to this are not going to go back to that, I don't think. So. I think one of the most important things out of what Caroline and Vera have said are that it's it's our ability to characterise the disease so well that enables us to expand our active surveillance pool. Um, Andrew, your thoughts? I can tell well, you're buzzing yeah, to speak. He's been very patient. <laughs> he's been really well, patient. Also, bef before you do, sorry, so did Andrew really write assumptions <laughs> 50, 50, oh, 50 48 times? 48 times? I think it was about 48. That's I counted incredible. It. Did you know that, Andrew? Did you write the word assumptions 48 times in a three-page article? Uh, that... Well, you know, it, quite possibly, but this is what you do in modeling studies. But a lot of the assumptions, <laughs> remember, would deliver, you know, you have to make these assumptions. We yeah. make assumptions in every single study that we make, right? We make an assumption that, for example, in the precision study, we assume that the quality of MRI in my local institution is the same as the quality of the MRI as used in precision. You, know, you don't say, oh, we're going to assume that, but as a mathematical modeler, you make those assumptions more explicit. Uh, it's not at all unusual. As I said, what we do with the assumptions is I made them very favorable to MRI, and then it altered them to, uh, you know, if, and by the way, it was also, there's a spreadsheet published as well. If you want to change any of those assumptions because you think they're wrong, show me, change them and, and, and show me that as a result of that, MRI has an acceptable level, MRI targeting has an acceptable level of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Some of the things you said, for example, yeah, but you can't compare ERSPC because the treatment was so much worse. Well, hang on, if that's the case, you would have seen more deaths in the, in the ERSPC. You would have seen more than seven deaths. That is arguing against your position that MRI targeting is finding the cancers that are potentially fatal. Uh, if the treatment was worse and you only had seven deaths. Um, the other thing is, I mean, you know, the, the study that I used in that, uh, the empirical study I used in my modeling paper, it's just one of, there's one of many, like there's the Danish studies that have just come out, very low long-term mortality. I actually like the Jotterborg study, 450 men with uh, a negative systematic biopsy. So uh, what we know is had those men undergone an MRI biopsy, uh, at the time, we would have found an extra 100 cancers. We would have treated an extra 50 guys. Um, it's, you look, they, there are five deaths reported at 20 years. None of those men would have died under contemporary protocols. So, for example, there was one man with a PSA in the 70s or something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's not just that one study. Very consistent evidence that if you have great group one, or no cancer found on a systematic biopsy, uh, your long-term risk of death is very low. A couple of other things I want to come back to. Um, what Caroline said, what everyone else says, uh, and I, I think Vera too, is, is, is uh, and, and Declan, you said, well, we don't want to go backwards, right? Well, you're kind of mushing the two together, MRI imaging and MRI targeting. And it's a bit like me saying, don't eat the apricot pit, and you guys saying, but wait a minute, we're going to just eat carbs all day. We need fruit and vegetables. Right, it is perfectly possible to, and in fact, I mean, uh, Keith uh, Kowalczyk does this, right? Does the MRI, if the MRI doesn't show a lesion, doesn't do the uh, biopsy, terrific, great, right? We're reducing overdiagnosis, overtreatment. If it shows a lesion, it says, look, 
if the cancer is that bad, I'm going to find it by putting a needle in the right place. I don't have to bang in four or five needles and then choose the one with the highest grade. Because that's the current practice. There's clear evidence that, uh, it, you know, if our, by the way, so it, here's the important point. If you are saying right now that we should not, if, if somebody has a systematic biopsy and it comes back as four plus three, and somebody else on systematic biopsy, nothing was found, but on the targeted biopsy, it was four plus three, we should treat those men differently, right? One maybe should get more aggressive treatment, maybe the other can be monitored for a while. Then we're, you know, perhaps all on the same page, right? The method of detection has implications for oncologic aggressiveness. That, that's the basic point. So this isn't anti-MRI. It may not even be anti-MRI targeting, but we have to take into account the fact that, that the method of detection has an effect on oncologic aggressiveness. I mean, one of the now, if we want to mush it all together again, MRI targeting, question for, for Vero, how many cancers were found in each arm of precision? Right, were more cancers found in the targeted arm or fewer? Right, I mean, do, do, do you know those data? Yeah, so from the clinically significant cancers, it was 38%. No, 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 no. All cancers, total number of cancers found in each arm. What was it? Yeah, if you add up the significant and insignificant, you can get that. So I'll give you the figures and you're the statistician, you can calculate well, it I for me. Well, I can tell you, it's exactly the same. It's ex I think it's out by one, right? The total number of cancers found in each arm of precision was basically the same, but there were more clinically significant cancers in the MRI arm, right? I think if we if we were just a bit more careful about targeting, we could actually you know reduce the number of cancers that we found in an MRI uh, pathway, and we would avoid overdiagnosis and overtreatment. What we use all the precision. If you look at the tables of precision, is that the two groups we found the same number of cancers, so the same amount of overdiagnosis and so on. Uh, but we're just treating more cancers. But that, I, that, that, well, I have to stop you there. That's just nonsense, well, right? And it. only you could say well, that because that's just not true. There's the same amount of cancers well, in each arm, but of course, in the standard biopsy arm, they were finding all these cancers we didn't need to find. So there was much okay. less. If so that matters upgrading. to us, Andrew, a urologist and patients. I mean, I. There was upgrading. Yeah. If all I'm just going to bust in. Uh, yeah. Caroline, 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 over to Caroline. And I'll be not giving them a chance. <laughs> so busting in as I'm learning to do. I think what we need to look at also is the risk of treatment so if you your likelihood of having a treatment on an mr pathway is less we've there's a there's a nice um publication recently looking at uk and, and us data in the uk we do very little over treatment and we definitely do some under treatment that's potentially reversed in, in the us and i think you have to look at that as well so i would say really clearly do the MRI, use the information. If you've seen the MRI scan and then you've got the biopsy needle in your hand, why would you not look to interrogate that lesion and, and, and see what it contains? That's why you're doing a biopsy to see if there's a cancer and it's significant. In terms of what else you biopsy, I tend to biopsy the other peripheral zone and then use the information. So you're, what you're saying, Andrew, it seems to me is that you look at is the cancer more aggressive because we found it on an MR targeting uh, basis? Well, not necessarily, but what we want to know is what is the burden of cancer? A standard biopsy doesn't always give us that very accurately. An MRI gives us a, an accurate volume when, it, when the tumor is clearly seen, and then we get an accurate grade from the MRI targeting, and we need to put all that information together and use it, not do an MRI and then not look at it when we're doing a biopsy. So, I, so I mean... There's a couple of things you're saying is inevitable. If you do an MRI, then you absolutely 100% have to put in three needles uh, or four needles and adopt the rule that the needle with the highest grade is the true grade. I mean, I, I don't think that's the case. We can change the, you know, we don't have to put in three or four needles. We can change our grading rules. Yeah, um, so we, we, we don't have to put in three or four needles. So right. in, in MRI practice, if you have a massive lesion you know we have a pathway where everybody gets mr straight up so sometimes you see a, a tumor that fills most of the prostate you, you know you don't you could biopsy that with your finger and a, and a needle along you don't even need ultrasound yeah. but you know you've got it there so you take a, a couple and then a couple for research depending on what study they're going to go into etc 
we have the concept and the, and the reporting of our pathologists in, in, in our centre in the UK. They'll give the highest grade and they'll give the overall grade. And that takes into account a small bit of high, you know, really high grades. Tumour might not represent the overall thing. That's why you get some downgrading from MR targeted biopsy to radical prostatectomy pathology. And that's fine. And we should be taking that into account. And as I say, in our centre, you know, we try to take that into account. And I hope in five years' time, there'll be a nice little web calculator where you can put in your risks. We don't have that at the moment, but we have to use the information we've got right. in a thoughtful manner. Oh. But that's, that's exactly the problem. I think we're agreeing that a 4 plus 3 found by systematic biopsy is not the same animal as a 4 plus 3 when you put in multiple needles and then you take the highest grade. And so we have to adjust what we do. Right now, so to be very clear, I'm not a clinician. I'm not saying you should be doing A, you should be doing B, you should be ignoring it. But let's be aware of what the data tells us. The data tells us that what we're currently doing is finding a lot of cancers that we're calling grade group three, four, or five. And yet we have evidence that those cancers have an incredibly low likelihood of acquiring a lethal phenotype. I'm so not, I just don't, I just don't buy it. Look, uh, we're going to have to finish oh, up. Unfortunately, we're, we are running yeah. out of time, but we could go on for, it's a brilliant, this is probably the longest ever episode of UCAS and we <laughs> could go for ages and look, brilliant points. Great to have everyone on. But I, I, I just think from a clinical point of view, Andrew, from my point of view is that I understand where you're coming from, but we're not going to go back to the paradigm of raised PSA, trust biopsy uh, and so on. And remember, no one's if you miss that. And if you no miss it, is, yeah. yeah, and prop it up with genomic markers and so on, because we've moved on to that. No and I just think clinical it's interesting what you're writing about, but it's not going to have any clinical impact in my view. I think people are just interesting. Okay, there we go. That's interesting. We're not changing what we do. No one's going to change guidelines because of any of these articles you're writing. It'd be good to design studies that might help answer the hypothesis you're generating. But uh, it's interesting to write about. It's taking up space. I enjoy reading it. It's good to talk about it. But I don't think it's got any clinical impact. You can bark up the tree, I think, all you like. But my interpretation is the ship has sailed. And we believe what we've been discussing here is that MR, to yeah. first of all, avoid the over-detection of cancers is good. I think you, yeah, well, you accept that. And second, MR to target biopsies is giving us true information to characterize the disease. And whether that's four plus three and we decide to treat it or not, and so on, is something we take into account. And we are revisiting how we manage them, but we're, never, we're, never, we're not going to change back from this uh, because I think we clearly think it's be be better, regardless of you saying 15 years later and based on your SBC. No, no one's listening to the noise, I no think. I honestly okay. think, you know, save your breath and put your talent into something else, your immense talent. And, uh, because uh, I, I honestly don't think, I just think it's noise. Caroline, honest, Caroline, know. go ahead. Okay. Right. Concordance is something we should look at. So concordance, so it may be that if you've got eight millimeters, four plus three on your standard biopsy, you look on your MRI, that needle like went through what looks like an eight millimeter maximum diameter tumor, great. But we also know that with a standard biopsy, you might catch the edge of the tumor, you might not. So look to see whether they match. If you've got you know, large amounts of tumor on your MRI, smaller amounts of tumor on your biopsy, go with the ceiling of it that you see on the MRI scan. If you've done your biopsy first, then, then look at it and take it all into account, but don't ignore information that can be relevant. Yeah, so, so I think that. I... <laughs> oh, I thought I thought we could get rid of Andrew, but no, he's going to yeah. show me. Andrew, please, we're gonna we're gonna leave. Uh, we'll take a final word from you on it, uh, if you don't mind. No, we could go for ages. Maybe we'll go again, but uh, yeah, please, please give <laughs> give us your final thoughts because okay. we we really do have to finish. The ship sails. The data aren't going to change my mind. You know that is not a good look, Declan. Right? No one is saying we're going to stuff this genie back in the bottle, but we have to be aware of the fact that what looks really bad under the microscope may not have a lethal phenotype. And so we may have to think about how we grade MRI targeted biopsy cores. We have to rethink how we treat patients who have high grade disease on MRI targeted uh, biopsy. And we can think of putting, not putting four or five needles in, but just putting in one needle. There's all sorts of things that we can do that don't involve, oh, just go back 20 years ago or whatever. No one is suggesting that. I think we just need to be a little bit cautious and not complacent and say the ship has sailed and we know what to do now because I don't think we do.
And we have to face the fact that, with, that targeting is finding a lot of aggressive tumours that probably do not have a lethal phenotype or apparently. So. Yeah, well, well stated, well summarised and good pointers of where we need to go with a lot of this, I think, as well. On, on just yeah. a final comment I'll make about the needles is that, you know, th- we do targeted biopsies, of course, but I always try and put two or three needles into a lesion. It kind of depends on the size, but, you know, it's not an exact science and uh, whether you're doing fusion or cognitive or whatever, yeah. you know, it, if you're going to rely on that information as we tend to do, I, I don't want to miss that lesion. And remember, we're not doing it in the MR scanner, we're doing it in an ultra, you know, ultrasound guided, so I think it's still reasonable for us as clinicians to do that. Caroline, any yeah, final words from you uh, before we hand to Viru. We've got a tumor board to get to, uh, we so do. Um, we're keeping. It's worth waiting. It's worth having them <laughs> waiting for this conversation. But uh, Caroline, yeah, just that I think things are changing all the time. We do need to take into account new information. I really hope that the formal risk calculators and the you know guidelines and all the rest of it will have MRI parameters in there. We know that they're important in terms of volume and visibility, and yeah. I think that's what we need to be working on over the next five years or so. Yeah, fantastic. And Viru, final thoughts? So, yeah, it's been a good discussion. Um, I think to conclude, you know, we have level one evidence that uh, MRI before a biopsy improves outcomes that we think are important. But I acknowledge Andrew's argument about the fact that that disease may mean something slightly different. And we need to do some work to find out what that means. Totally. So, Declan, continue MRI and MRI targeting. Uh, Yeah, I think so. But I'm going to think more carefully about it Absolutely. and read yeah. Andrew's work more carefully about it because, as ever, he's very smart and makes you know makes us challenge what we do and assumptions we make. It's the day of the word. We must put assumptions into the title of this one somehow. 48 times, you say. That's great trivia. Fantastic. I like it. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thank Caroline. You. Thank you so much to both all three of you, and we look forward to catching you again soon. Take care. Goodbye.